I wonder if I could have you all be seated and let me begin right away. How many of you have enjoyed Proof for L.A.? Well, I look at how many of you there are tonight. We have a capacity crowd. We give God the glory. We did not come to see a man. We came to see Christ. We are the only movement in the history of the world where the founder attends every meeting. So say it after me, he's here. Say, he is here. Okay, and because he is here, I, I caught you off guard. And because he is here, all things are possible. All things are possible. I want you to look with me at a chapter in the Bible, in the eighth chapter of Acts. This is not in the order that I gave to the people. I'm jumping down to Acts chapter 8 in verse 9. I'd like everyone to look in the Word of God at Acts chapter 8, verse 9. I want to open by telling you that in a few minutes, I'm going to invite people to get up out of their seat and walk down here to the front. And when you do, your past sins will be erased. Now, it will not be like going to confession. This is not going to be a regular spot removing, but a profound cleansing. And it is not until you've been cleansed that you understand the power of being cleansed. A clean heart is an astonishing gift. It changes you in ways that are very difficult to understand until you've experienced it. The greatest act of faith you will ever take in your life is that when you hear the promise of God, look at me, when you hear the promise of God that if I turn to Christ, heroin will no longer control me. Alcohol will no longer control me. Fentanyl will not kill me. I will not be addicted. I will not be diseased. I will not be a slave to anyone. Now, everyone in this room needs to be honest with me but mainly with God. You have the features of slavery and many of the things you do. You know that. You will not admit it maybe to somebody else, but in your heart to yourself, you know that you've been enslaved. There are people that have abused you. There are people that have maliciously used you. And as you're seated in this tent tonight, you're wondering if it's true. If I were to walk up there, if I were to stand before God and say, Jesus, forgive me, wash me, take me, would I have power over my habits? I want you to listen to me. Would I no longer fear the future? Would I be able to stand and know that God is pleased with me and that God is now my friend. Those are impossible things to tell the average gangster. Those are things you cannot tell the billionaire. There is a step toward God that requires faith. You have to say, I can't imagine it, I don't know it, but I'm going to give God a clear and honorable opportunity to change my life. There's no telling how important that step of faith is. And it will cost you something. Anyone that preaches to you that there is no cost to discipleship is not reading the owner's manual. Anyone that tells you you can serve God without people disliking you is lying to you. But there was a certain man, verse 9, called Simon, 
who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. Everybody listen to the next verse. To whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him, verse 11, because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you it's going to have a threshold conversation with an old friend. I'm going to tell you something. The supernatural is going to jump on the American scene with a vengeance. Let me tell you who is going to be in the minority. The scientist who doesn't believe in God. The person who doesn't believe in the devil. The individual that thinks there is no supernatural realm is going to be completely in the minority. False miracles are coming. False prophets are coming. There are going to be people performing acts that will stun crowds and individuals will be fooled. And many who think that they would never be part of a deception don't understand that they are in fact going to be part of a deception. The Bible says perilous times will come because of what men will be. The word perilous is also the word fierce. Look me in the eye. How many of you believe that fierce is a good word to describe today? Let's go over here. How many of you believe that fierce is a good word to describe today? The murder is fierce. The abuse of children is fierce. The yelling, the screaming, the division, the heart, the intensity of robbery and victimization of people is fierce. Now that word fierce only appears in the New Testament twice. Once in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 and the other in Luke chapter 8 when it says a demon possessed man was exceedingly fierce. It is not by accident that suddenly the church is interested in deliverance again because more and more people are reporting demonic power controlling their life. This is why I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, and I want you to hear the word. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because if you have a demon, where are you going to go? A psychiatrist? A doctor? A shaman? He can't even get rid of his own devil. When you can no longer sleep, when appetites grow perverse, when your habits start to control you, when feelings of profound grief and anger and sorrow convulse in you, you are starting to understand that we're living in a time where the veil is going to be torn. The supernatural is going to be everywhere. There will be Satan clubs. There will be classes on the supernatural everywhere. Superstition is going to run rampant through Los Angeles. People that claim to be scientific will bow down to idols. People that claim to be intelligent will give themselves over to sacrificing, bloodletting, and invading graveyards. It's all coming back. And it's going to come back on a massive scale. And why am I not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Because we are the club, we are the group, we are the family that has authority over Satan. The church will not be unaffected. This onslaught of demonic power will not go unnoticed in the church. Jesus said in the book of Luke, he said, and that day will be shortened, lest the elect itself be deceived. I want all of you to know this, that Jesus taught something very true. You are never in the neutral place. There's never a time where you can say the devil is no longer going to bother me. He bothers me because I'm bothering him. 
But he, if you're a lukewarm believer and you think, well, the devil's going to leave me alone because I'm not a threat, he's going to go after you first. Now, when someone had the Spirit of God, gave it up to deconstruct, that vacuum is going to be filled. And the Bible says that when a demon is cast out, it goes through dry ground, dry spaces, looking for somebody else to inhabit. I'm looking at you right now and I'm telling you a whole city of Samaria was abandoning Yahweh, the God of Israel, in order to serve a sorcerer. The reason that I'm preaching this is because I want every pastor to understand the nine gifts of the Spirit. No longer, boy, I got to say this right. No longer will a church be allowed not to operate in the nine gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to say it another way. No longer will it be an option to allow the prophetic discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues, prophesying, faith, wisdom, and healing to operate in your church. We are in the hour where the only church that will grow will be a supernatural church. I'm going to say it again. The only church that's going to grow is a supernatural church. Because the people who are going to come knocking on your door have devils. And because they have devils, they're going to need deliverance. 